Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the phylogenetic positions of colugos and tree shrews. So let's jump right in. Here we are on the 16th episode of this series, and we have finally reached the end of the order of primates, getting into the wider diversity of placental mammals. Before we can officially step out, though, we have a few more clades of early primates to discuss. One is the Adapiformes, a paraphyletic assemblage of stem strepsorines dating from 56 to 11.1 million years ago. These primates have been found across North America, Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa, and the group includes three families, Nothartidae, including Nothartus, Civiladapidae, including Civiladapus, and Adapidae, including Adapus. One relatively famous member of Adapiformes is Darwinius Massillae from the Messel Pit of Germany, dating to 47 million years ago. In 2009, a paper was published which argued that Darwinius was a stem haplorine, not a stem strepsorine. If true, this would mean that Adapiformes is paraphyletic, or as a group ancestral to all primates, not just the strepsorines, and Darwinius would thus blur the line between stem strepsorines and stem haplorines. This story was rather hyped up a bit by various news outlets who proclaim that the missing link has been found. Of course, anyone familiar with how evolution works would ridicule this idea as a relic of the great chain of being nonsense, but news websites get paid by the clicks, not by the veracity of their information. Further, later analyses of Darwinius reassigned it to stem strepsorines, but that doesn't in any way detract from the beauty and awe of the original fossil. Recent analyses have argued that the lineage leading to crown strepsorines split from the other Adapiformes in the early Eocene. On the line to crown strepsorines, we find two extinct families, Azibiidae and Gibilimuridae. Azibiidae contains two genera, Azibius and Algeripithecus, both of whom are from Africa, and Gebelimuridae contains a few genera, such as Gebelimer and Omanodon, also from Africa. Clearly, strepsorines originated in Africa and then spread outward to Asia and Madagascar later. Then there's Plesiopithecus, who throws a moderately sized lemur wrench into the previous tale. Recall, if you will, that the Eye Eyes tale was in part a discussion of the monophyletic clade of lemuroids that presently exists on Madagascar. That much hasn't changed. The family that contains the eye eye, Dobbintoniidae, is still considered sister to all other lemuroids, mouse lemurs, sportive lemurs, injuries, etc. The bit that has changed is this. The eye eye might have arrived on Madagascar separately from the others. While all the other lemuroids diversified from a single common ancestor on Madagascar, the Ai's ancestors came to Madagascar in a separate rafting event from Africa. The story, however, depends on the phylogenetic placement of Plesiopithecus from the late Eocene and Propato from the early Miocene. Plesiopithecus was found in 1992 in Egypt and has been placed by some phylogenetic analyses as sister to Crown Strepsorini. However, a 2018 analysis argued that Plesiopithecus should be considered a crown strepsorine, specifically a stem dobintoniid. One reason is that its teeth are what we should expect for the transition from a tooth comb to the enlarged incisors of eye eyes. Remember that the tooth comb is made of forward pointing lower incisors and lower canines, and the canines are flattened. In Plesiopithecus, one pair of incisors has been lost, and the other pair has grown much larger. Further, the canines have been pushed back, but are still flattened and forward-pointing. Plesiopithecus also still retains its three premolars, which is the ancestral condition for strepsorines. The eye eye lacks its canines and premolars, so Plesiopithecus represents an intermediate state from the ancestral strepsorine tooth anatomy to the eye eye's bizarre condition. Now we turn to the other problematic primate. 
Propato was named by George Gaylord Simpson in 1967 based on the remains of three mandibles found in Kenya. But later that year, paleontologist Alan Walker reevaluated Propato, arguing instead that the mandibles belonged to a fruit bat. That isn't really surprising. Fossils are often smashed or bent in ways that can unfortunately mask their true affinities, especially if the fossil in question is just a few centimeters long. In 1984, more specimens of Propato were found, and though their discoverer pointed out that the specimens are somewhat similar to lemuroids, he also pointed out their similarities with fruit bats. So, Propato stayed a purported fruit bat until 2018. Then, a re-examination of Propato's fossils helped assign it yet again to the lemuroids. For one thing, the researchers compared its molars against those of 222 Eurocontins and 7 Chiropterans, in an automated morphometric analysis, and found that the molars are definitely strepsorine, not chiropterin. Further, the molar's location on the graph is very close to both the II and Plesiopithecus. Thus, a phylogenetic analysis incorporating Plesiopithecus and Propato found that Propato is sister to Daventoniidae, with Plesiopithecus sister to both of them. The split between the II and the other lemuroids occurred about 41.1 million years ago in Africa, and then the II and Propato split about 27.9 million years ago in Africa. Sometime after that, ancestors of the II rafted to Madagascar, so not only did the common ancestor of all lemuroids raft to Madagascar, but the extant lineage most closely related to lemuroids did as well. Now we find ourselves at the split between Strepsorini and Haplorini. Though this split occurred about 65 million years ago, as we mentioned in the previous tale, the radiation of primates across Asia, Europe, and North America occurred during and shortly after the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. The PETM occurred about 55.5 million years ago and lasted for about 200,000 years. During this event, the Earth's average temperature rose to 5 to 8 degrees Celsius, having been caused at least in part by major volcanism in the North Atlantic Igneous Province. As a result of higher temperatures, that means there would have been forests in higher latitudes, increasing the available area for primates to live. It is also no surprise that perissodactyls and artiodactyls spread across Asia, Europe, and North America immediately following the PETM. The oldest Asian and European primate is the stem haplorine tile hardina, which lived from 55.5 to 47 million years ago. The first occurrence of this primate is in Asia, then it occurred in Europe 4 to 10,000 years later, and then in North America 9 to 15,000 years after that, coincident with the adapiform contius. Unsurprisingly, the North American tile hardina is more derived than the European one, which is more derived than the Asian one. Both the phylogenetic and stratigraphic pattern suggest that the Asian tile hardina is the most primitive, giving rise to the European one, and then finally the North American one. But tile hardina isn't the only example of this Europe to North America via Greenland pattern. The North American stem artiodactyl Diacodexus illicis is slightly larger and more derived than the European Diacodexus gigasi. The European creodont Arphea gingrichi is less derived than the North American Arphea junii, and the European creodont Prototomus minimus is less derived than the North American Prototomus demos. So, crown primates may have originated in Asia or Europe. The closest relatives of primates, such as Don Rosselia and the Plesiodapiformes, occur in Europe, and some members of the latter occur in North America. They too likely dispersed from Europe to North America across Greenland. Plesiodapiformes existed from 58 to 55 million years ago in the late Paleocene and had an arboreal lifestyle like primates. However, they had some strangely rodent-like characteristics. For example, they had large incisors separated from their molars by a gap. They even had eyes facing more to the sides as opposed to forward-facing eyes, which is the condition for primates. Finally, sitting sister to all other stem and crown primates is the small shrew-like Purgatorius, which lived from 66 to 63 million years ago. Its affinities have been heavily debated for decades, with some analyses placing it even outside crown eutheria. However, the most recent analyses I can find place it as a stem primate. Really, the fact that it is so difficult to figure out where exactly this fossil goes makes perfect sense on evolution. 
We expect fossils to look more and more like closely related species the further we go back in time because we are getting ever closer to the common ancestor. In this case, we are getting closer to the common ancestor of primates and colugos, so we should expect the common ancestor to look primitive compared to both modern clades. We reach our common ancestor with colugos, order Dermoptera, about 70 million years ago. There are two extant species of colugos, the Sunda flying lemur, Galeopterus variegatus, and the Philippine flying lemur, Cynocephalus volans, neither of which fly, nor are lemurs. Instead, colugos glide with their large flaps of skin that stretch from the head to the limbs to the tail. Colugos are herbivorous, and their incisors have evolved analogously to the tooth combs that lemurs have. Colugos were originally grouped with bats based on morphology by Linnaeus, and both were considered close to primates. Later, Darwin referenced colugos in Origin of Species, noting that there would have been no difficulty for natural selection to hone the gliding abilities of a colugo-like ancestor into the flight capabilities of bats. There are two species of fossil colugos, both under the genus Dermatherium, dating to the late Eocene and late Oligocene. There is also a eutherian called Plagiomena that has been traditionally considered as a stem colugo, but some analyses have placed it as a stem primate or even basal to both. Now let's take a look at the world we're in. 70 million years ago, something should look a little bit different about our planet. There are no elephants, hippos, rhinos, antelopes, cows, horses, or really any mammals larger than a few kilograms. We'll meet the early members of those clades in later tales, but for now, the major difference is that we're in the world of non-avian dinosaurs. At this time, on the same continent as where we find colugos today, were theropods like the 10-foot-tall Tarbosaurus and the much smaller Velociraptor, huge hadrosaurs like Saurolophus, and towering sauropods like Nemegtosaurus. Alas, we're here for the mammals today. Molecular clocks indicate that, with a few exceptions, the crown members of most extant eutherian orders emerged after the cretaceous Paleogene or KPG extinction event. Most splits between eutherian orders, however, occurred prior to the KPG extinction in the late Cretaceous. The KPG extinction was caused in large part by a 10 to 15 kilometer or 6 to 9 mile wide bolide striking the Earth 66 million years ago in the Yucatan Peninsula. This idea, originally called the Alvarez Hypothesis after Lewis and Walter Alvarez, was first proposed in 1980 based on a collection of particular geological phenomena found specifically at strata dated 66 million years old. That includes, quote, relict and glass spherules formed when hot ejected melt and vapor rapidly cooled in the atmosphere or space, shocked quartz and zircon generated by pressures greater than 10 gigapascals, magnesioferrite spindles, meteoric chromium isotopic ratios, iridium and other platinum group elements in absolute and relative abundances not otherwise found on Earth, and in some places, soot suggesting significant wildfires in the wake of the impact, close quote. Then in 2019, researchers found in North Dakota a site containing organisms killed directly and indirectly by the KPG impactor. They named it the Tannis Site. One of the first discoveries at the Tannis Site was numerous acephensoriform fish who died with glass spherules embedded in their gills. However, the discovery of giant gars just above the iridium layers suggests that freshwater ecosystems had largely recovered 1.5 to 2.5 thousand years later. Our common ancestor with colugos probably looked like Purgatorius or some other shrew-like mammal. In fact, all of the mammalian common ancestors we're going to meet in the Mesozoic looked vaguely shrew-like. That brings us to the other member of today's tale, tree shrews, order Scandentia. There are four genera of tree shrews, Anathana, Dendrogale, Tupaya, and Tilocercus, amounting to 23 species. They are all small, arboreal insectivores native to southern Asia. A tree shrew fossil from 34 million years ago is strikingly similar to modern Tilocercus, indicating that, like the Tarsiers, tree shrews have changed little morphologically for a long time. Now that we have met both the Colugos and tree shrews, let's get to their tail. While the monophyly of all primates is well attested by morphological and genetic studies, and the monophyly of rodents and lagomorphs, collectively called Glyra, is also firmly grounded, the phylogenetic positions of Colugos and tree shrews are not. As said earlier, colugos were previously grouped with bats based on morphology, and both were grouped in the order of primates by Linnaeus. With the advent of molecular techniques, bats were moved from primates to Laurasiatheria, whom we will meet in a later tale, 
and colugos have been pretty firmly placed as sister to primates. See our video with Tony Reed on bat evolution for more details. Tree shrews, however, are another story. Tree shrews were previously placed in insectivora with shrews, hedgehogs, and moles, but genetic data moved tree shrews to Eurachontaglara, the clade encompassing rodents and lagomorphs, colugos, and primates. Unfortunately, tree shrews have been put in just about every conceivable placement within this superorder. They have been sister to colugos, sister to colugos plus primates, sister to rodents and lagomorphs, and basally derived with respect to all these clades. What this likely tells us is that Uarchontogliars rapidly speciated in the late Cretaceous, leading to very short branches and lots of incomplete lineage sorting. Indeed, a 2016 paper puts the last common ancestor between rodents and primates at 77.84 million years ago, the split between rodents and tree shrews at 76.94 million years ago, and the split between primates and colugos 75.47 million years ago. Those are some very short branches. Under evolution, we should expect that when multiple closely related lineages split from each other around the same time, they should have many genes that are relatively similar. This would therefore make trying to untangle their exact relationships somewhat difficult. We have already seen this to be the case with humans, chimps, and gorillas, as well as neo-aves. This is also an issue for Lophotrochozoans, whom we shall meet in a much later tale. So that's the Kalugo's tale. Even with increased morphological, genetic, and fossil data, figuring out precise phylogenetic relationships isn't always going to be simple. Of course, we have already seen this in the tales of the Denisovans and Gibbons, so it should come as no surprise. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.